Welcome back everyone to part two of building your data engineering project. If you recall in this series about building your first data engineering project, in our first video, we discussed finding data sources and we covered a few places you could find some great data sources online, as well as some concepts in data modeling and making sure you spend some time thinking about exactly how you're gonna build uh, your overall data product before getting started. Because before starting your data engineering project, uh, I think it's really important to think through exactly what your project is going to be. Again, this isn't just a data analysis project where you can kind of just do some ad hoc work, maybe have some high level questions you're aiming to answer, but then kind of just do very ad hoc work. In this case, we're trying to build infrastructure that we're likely going to be using for a long period of time. And so that's why data engineering projects tend to be a little bit different than maybe something like a data analysis project. In fact, they're more similar to software engineering projects than they are analysis projects. In this video, I wanted to focus on how we actually can extract data and then load it into some form of data warehouse or database. In this case, we're using Airflow, Postgres, and S3 to kind of act as our different conduits. So we're gonna download data from an online source into S3, and then from S3, upload the data to Postgres. In particular, we're gonna to have to change a few things on our Postgres instance in order to actually allow it to connect easily to S3. So we're just gonna basically allow it to essentially query S3 directly and just pull it from S3 without having to do any weird extra code. It's really nice in this case, how you can just do that and not have to, again, add extra code. But if you've got the right connections already set up and have the right policies in place on your AWS instance, you can easily do this. Again, we will have to do some things in order to set up the right policies in terms of your AWS instance. So your Postgres can actually connect to your S3, but I'll kind of at least talk you high level through those steps and give you the commands at the very least in the link below, but maybe a little bit in this video itself. So look for the gist below if you're looking just for the direct code, but otherwise let's get kind of started into setting up this whole process. Let's get started guys. So like I said, before we go anywhere, we need to actually configure a few things. And now I'm also assuming right now, here are the three things you should already have set up in AWS. One, an S3 instance, two, an EC2 instance, and three, an RDS instance, in this case of Postgres. Um, otherwise, you're not gonna be able to set up what I'm doing here. Once you have those three things set up, then you can kind of go forward with this, but make sure again, you have those three things set up. If you need some instructions on that, I'll put a link below to like an AWS course, but I'm not gonna kind of cover, you know, how to set up each of those in this video. Okay, assuming you already have, again, RDS set up as well as EC2, here's the commands you'll need to run. And again, I'm not gonna type through all of this, but I'll share it below so you can easily configure this quickly. Step one, you need to run create extension AWS underscore S3 on your Postgres instance. And this will essentially allow you to work with some stored procedures and functions on Postgres that will let you interact with S3. And so you'll see that later when we have a query where we're gonna directly interact with S3. So that's just a quick way of doing that. Once you have that, then we have to go through this multi-step process of setting up a role, a policy, as well as connecting that to a certain database and then creating some sort of VPC endpoint that you can actually access. And so this is all important because again, you just need to have that security layer where you can actually provide access to your Postgres instance, to your S3 instance. And so looking at this, you can kind of break this down as one, two, basically everywhere you see is starting with AWS as its own individual line for, um, and this is kind of a 3.5, which will, or like a four point pre four, I'll cover 3.5. So let's just kind of go over this really quickly. So for this first one, you can kind of see it just creates a role, try to give it something that's meaningful in terms of referencing the fact that this is a Postgres S3 role policy. Again, pretty self-explanatory. You're just creating a policy and then attaching that role and policy together. You will need your AWS ID, which you can find on your management console. If you go up to the top right corner, you should be able to drop down and it should have like a little number there. That's essentially your ID. You can replace that here. Then you're gonna need to add that role essentially to your DB instance. And that's what you're doing here, where this database three right here is essentially the name of your database. So whatever you name that database when you're first creating it, that's what you're putting here. You're not gonna need to put like the IP here. You can just put the name. And then again, same thing with your AWS uh, management console ID and your region. And then this next part, you can run this command here, AWS EC2, et cetera. This will just give you the VPC ID that you need here, as well as the route table ID here. Um, to run this final kind of command. So that will set up your basis for allowing Postgres and S3 to interact. And so that's kind of a quick run down there. Again, I'll have a gist below for this. So you won't have to like look at this and type it out manually. Uh, I wouldn't do that to you. If you ever do a code tutorial yourself, I'd recommend the same thing just because again, it's, it can be obnoxious to make someone, you know, pause it and type this entire thing here. Just copy paste it. Let them copy paste it. Oh, I realized I actually skipped this one. Sorry about that, guys. My apologies, guys. I skipped this whole policy here. Um, but yes, you'll also need to um, attach the role in the policy. Okay, now we can go forward with this. In theory, everything should be 
set up in terms of this base level connection. Now we need to actually set up your EC2 instance. Um, you're gonna need to install Airflow, which is just essentially install Apache Airflow. And I'm assuming you already have uh, Python 3, but if you don't, you can just run pip3 and pip3. Um, we're also going to use pip3 install Apache Airflow for Postgres. That will just allow us to do some Postgres stuff in Airflow. So you'll, you'll need this for a baseline. So now let's go over to the code. So assuming you've already installed uh, Airflow, which again is just pip3 install, Apache Airflow. We can start kind of getting to this next part, which is setting up Airflow itself. In order to set up Airflow now, you'll have to actually initialize it, which is just Airflow DB in it. I always want to say init DB for some reason, but it's DB in it. You'd hit enter. It kind of sets up everything, which I already have set up myself. And now you actually need to set up the web server and the scheduler, which are two different components essentially in Airflow. One essentially runs the web UI that you can access, and I'll show you that in a second. And the other will set up the actual scheduler that manages all of the jobs and DAGs that you set up. So let's run those commands real quick. I actually think I might already have Airflow running, but let's just see if, if it is. Okay, so that'll just run Airflow. Nope, yeah, I'm already running it. So in theory it would run, but I'm already running it. I could kill it, but I'm just gonna keep going. You would then also want to run create a user. So that's just in this command here where you've got Airflow user create, you gotta give it a username, first name, password, role, and email. Uh, you would need to then add a password. This will just ensure that when people access your Airflow instance, which will be very easy to access depending on how you set up your IAM and if it's on a virtual private cloud or things of that nature, at least there's some level of security. You know, you don't wanna leave your Airflow instance open. I mean, don't leave your Airflow instance open out to the internet anyways, but I've done that for this demo, which I will kill it anyways afterwards. So you can do that. You can take this command and then run the password. And then after that, you'll run Airflow Scheduler, which is what it sounds like. You really just run Airflow Scheduler. And then for both the Airflow web server and Airflow Scheduler, you will want to run it dash D. What that will essentially do is let you run it as a daemon underneath rather than it trying to run it live. And what will happen if you don't put the D is essentially it will just run on your open terminal. And then as soon as you quit that terminal, it will disappear. So that's not your goal. You want to be running underneath everything as a, as a process. So we'll just get rid of that for now, but that's the other thing you can run. Actually, I'll just do this so you can still see it. So yeah, Airflow Scheduler and then dash D. Now that you have all this set up, we could in theory access this Airflow instance. So let me go to that. Okay, so now I've essentially accessed the Airflow instance, which you can do as well, pretty simply. Um, put in the IP address of your EC2 instance and then put the um, 8080. You'll need to open up that port to access it. Again, there are some things here where you might wanna set this up on a virtual private cloud, so not everyone can access it. You know, Even though I have this login profile, I don't think it would take much to hack into it. So you know, make sure you've got this secure because you don't want to leave things that are open out to the internet. But essentially this is where everything will run in terms of all of your different DAGs that you create. You can see I've got a few here already that have kicked off and you can actually go and see how they've run. Um, you can see where they've kind of either arrowed out or had an issue, but this is essentially the tree view of looking at where tasks have kind of failed and succeeded. Uh, dark green being that they've succeeded, yellow being that they're on a retry and red being that they failed. You can see that in the legend over here as well. And this is where we're gonna kind of put our DAG. You just need to put it into the DAGs folder. You can configure it so it's not pointing at the DAGs folder that I'm gonna have, but for now, we're just gonna keep it in the Airflow file. If you wanna start messing with configuration, I think that's on you, but let's kind of go into building your first task really quickly here. So to start here, let's import everything that we need to import. And I'm gonna save you a little bit of time and just copy paste it so we can kind of talk through it. Instead of me sitting here and typing all of these various imports, I could probably organize this to be a little more alphabetical, but for now, we're kind of gonna go as it is. Um, so we're gonna to need to use a few different components. I just want to call them out more specifically for you guys. So operators are essentially uh, single ID potent tasks that you can kind of set up. So for example, bash operator allows you to run bash tasks. Dummy operator is really just what it sounds like. It's just a dummy blank operator. Python operator allows you to run Python tasks and Postgres uh, operator allows you to set up Postgres tasks. And now we're gonna need to connect to Boto3 as well for S3. And you will need to have already set up essentially your AWS configure credentials here. Um, if you've never done that before, again, I can leave some instructions below. You really just need to usually run like AWS configure and that should set up everything you need as long as you have some sort of API key already set up. And then from there, you can pretty much just type in client uh, equals Boto3.client and we're just gonna call it S3. If you want to manually do it, you can actually call out your API key and API secret. That's not the way you should be doing it. But if you're just trying to figure out 
if your API key and API secret are working, you can manually configure this to have that in there for the next two parameters that you provide it. But in theory, that's not the best way to do it. And that's not what we consider best practice. So this should be the way we do it here, calling it out and not referencing the direct uh, API key and API secret in your code base. Again, at the very least, you need to like have it in as an environmental variable, but that's again, still not the best way is AWS has a better way. Putting that aside, we need to set up this DAG, which if you've never heard the term DAG, it just stands for directed acyclic graph, which looks something like this in terms of setup for default arguments. All this essentially allows you to do is provide it certain configurations, like who's the owner. This will often be like a Unix name, start date. So when you're gonna start running this specific DAG, so you can see in this case, it's two days ago is when we're gonna start running this. Depends on paths kind of is what it sounds like. It basically references the fact that should this DAG always depend on a previous run. So if it didn't run yesterday, should it run today is kind of what's asking. And sometimes that's important when you think about it from a data engineering standpoint, because maybe you only get daily files. And in that case, you don't wanna run like an update or accidentally capture a change in data in the wrong order. And so that can be a major mistake in itself. And so maybe if you run today's data without yesterday's data, you'll have some sort of gap in data. Or maybe if you're trying to capture some sort of slowly changing dimension, it won't be recorded correctly. And so that's why it's important sometimes to have this set up. Email, it's where if you have an error, where to send those emails. That's what email on failure basically references. Should you send an email? Retries essentially references how often you should retry this DAG. This is kind of important too, because sometimes DAGs run and fail for reasons that are just temporary. Like maybe there was like a service 500 error or something where a server was down. And so instead of forcing it to fail, maybe have it rerun a few times just in case. With that set up, you can kind of call out the DAG, which I'm just going to use this with DAG reference. Um, we're going to do with DAG3. This first parameter should reference a unique name for the DAG because that's what's going to be referenced in the Airflow UI. And then default args essentially is referencing above and then how often you should run this. Like for example, here we're just running this every day, but maybe you've got a DAG that needs to run every hour or uh, just once a week or maybe on specific days. And that's where you would set up the certain interval. And that's the kind of automation portion of this. And then we've got this set colon, which will allow us to kind of do this indentation, which will reference everything underneath here being part of this DAG. And that's kind of why I like doing it with the indentation because it just, to me, makes it clear that this is this DAG and not something else. So before downloading the Department of Labor data that I've got planned to download, uh, I first wanted to show a test on how you can load data from S3 to Postgres, because that's gonna be one of the arguably trickier parts here. And you need to get this part right first before trying to figure out how to download just because this is where it can be a little tricky. If you didn't set up the policy correctly, this is where it's probably gonna show up. So let's kind of first do this task and then we'll do the next one. So here is what it's going to look like. And you'll see, we need to add a task ID as well here. So you can just call it something like upload DOL data to Postgres, probably a little wordy. But you'll notice here that all I'm referencing below is this select statement. It just uses this AWS library that we installed earlier and then imports it into S3. We then provide it the table name, which I just called it test here. After that, we need to give it the format of CSV. This here is the actual bucket name. After that, there is test01.csv and US East 2. And so this is kind of all we need to upload it. But you will notice there's one other thing missing here that I hope you kind of caught, which is this Postgres connection ID. And there's a lot of different ways you can connect to databases and store kind of this database information. Um, you, there's some things called hooks, which is one option. In this case, I just use connections that exist in Airflow. So you can actually set up these connections yourself. So let me just go over there really quickly to just show you where you can do this because this is essentially just referencing what can be viewed as an Airflow variable, which it's referencing here, but I've already set up the connection on Airflow itself. So when it says Postgres default, it knows where I'm pointing to. So jumping back over to Airflow, you'll see that you've got a bunch of little drop downs here. And one of those is admin. And in admin, you have connections. And connections is essentially what I'm referencing here. So if I were to go here into connections and then look up Postgres default, you'll find that this connection exists. And this XYZ would be the database name that I'm connecting to. So in order to do this, let's try to connect a new one or create a new one so you can kind of see what it looks like. You can hit this plus button here. And with that, you'll be taken to this form where you can actually set up uh, different types of connections depending on what you have installed this is where i had to run that pip3 install earlier where it was like uh, apache airflow dash postgres because um, you won't have postgres installed right away but you can set it up here um, then you can set up the host name 
the schema, which is your database name, the login username and port. And that's really all you need. And then you automatically have this connection set up. And that's, that's really it for this section. Again, that just makes it easy. You have other ways you can do this, but this is, I think one easy way to do it as you're getting started with your connection set up and this kind of basic set of code here, we're mostly going to start running this as is I'm going to add a few extra components here over the next few seconds, just so we can kind of have something a little more substantial. So give me a second to set all that up. So I'm just going to add this dummy task in here just so I've got it. And then we're going to say here, this S3 dot set downstream. And then we're going to put in ready task. And basically that's just saying that S3 should run and then the ready task should run. Some people like to put this ready task at the end, just so it's really clear that you always have the same end task. And so that's one thing that's helpful. It's like, if you have this same end task and it's always called the same thing, it's always aware or it's always easy to kind of connect into other pipelines. Like if you're trying to reference um, this pipeline in another pipeline, you already know what the end task should be called rather than having to jump into this code base, figure out what the last task is that's running here and then run all that. And so this is the basic DAG. And so I'm going to save it and see if this essentially runs. This should be pretty fast in terms of uh, connecting to S3. So as you can see, uh, basic DAG3 is already set up here. And then I can hit play here to actually make it run. Actually, I'm going to hit, sorry, not play, but unpause. So if I refresh this, it's going to start running. It might have a few errors, which we can work through here in a second. But let's see. So it's running. This is queued. Let me go to this basic DAG here. Okay, so you can see it's actually run both tasks successfully. You can see it's here, here. And if you wanna dig into this a little more, you can actually dig into the logs right here. So you can go here and see um, a little bit here where you can actually figure out how to rerun tasks. If that's what you need, clear tasks, mark as failed, mark as success, and look at logs, which is great. So if you have an error, this is where it would show up essentially. Um, in this case, it ran fine right? You can see that it ran fine. You can put some logging info in here as well. If you're running like a Python task, especially I recommend that. Um, in this case, you can just see this output, which again shows you it was a success. And so that's kind of your first DAG. We've just built your first DAG that has taken data from S3 and put it into uh, Postgres. So great job, everyone. Um, that's going to be where I'm going to pause for this video. There's going to be a ton more, I think in the next one where I'm going to actually show you how to download it. So that'll be 2.5. I know I just keep doing it in sections and pieces, but as you can see, there's a lot of information that we covered just in this one, just to set up S3 and Postgres and all of that. There's just a ton of little bits you can kind of learn along the way in terms of data engineering. And that's why doing data engineering projects can take so long because even making small decisions like what components to use along the way has impact, right? Like if you use Postgres, that has certain implications. If you instead use Snowflake, I think that's a little easier to connect to for anyone who likes Snowflake or some of the other components like BigQuery. I think those connections are a little easier than Postgres, but I do like the fact that you have this easy S3 input, which is a really quick query that you can use. Again, all of this code will be below. So you can use that uh, as your starting point and then build from there. So thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys next time. Thank you and goodbye.